Olga, tell us about social distancing from our dependencies. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And today I'm going to be talking about a timely matter. Uh, since we have spent all of us a few months applying physical social distancing, we can discuss today how we can uh, use those techniques uh, to make our systems a bit more reliable, uh, isolating our dependencies from them. Before I begin, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Olga Matuda, and I come from sunny Greece, while I currently reside in, as I said, very sunny London. Surprisingly, this week has been very nice. Um, I studied electrical engineering, but then software I won my heart. And I enjoy immersing myself into risky activities, be it public speaking, dancing with other people, or trying new recipes. And nowadays I work at Bloomberg as a software engineer, and I spend a lot of my time in my team debugging C++ code. Um, we do write some Python code as well, uh, we have mostly used Python as a tool for um, writing scripts to quickly uh, achieve something or for um, integration or end-to-end -end testing. Um, but uh, last year we had a crazy idea. How about we use Python for a real service? We wanted to do something simple and we said Python, it, it is a good opportunity for us to try using Python for something real that we can use in production. So that is what I'm saying today. This is a story of a Python service I written by C++ developers. And I promise you it's not a horror story, but it's a story of success and many, many learnings. As I said, we, uh, are, we have mainly been using C++ in the past and we have used Python for um, uh, simple applications. And um, this is how we tend to use Python. So, and this is how we envisioned our new service is going to look like. There's gonna be one function, we don't really need more. We're gonna have an input, we're gonna do the stuff we need, and we have, we're gonna have our output there. How hard could that be? Um, it turned out it wasn't that hard. That was, uh, we wrote some completely valid code that looks a bit like what you see on that screen. And we thought that we were ready, everything seemed to be working. And we had a meeting with our product manager, Mark. And he said, is this ready to go to production? And that is where we asked ourselves, okay, maybe we can, we can be safe as we do with all our other services. It's time to write some tests. And um, yeah, what could possibly go wrong with Python? But okay, let's write some tests. And that is when we realized that uh, that wasn't as easy as we had imagined previously. Um, we didn't really know how to write unit tests in, in Python. We had written an integration system test before, uh, but uh, unit testing was something new for us. Uh, we tried writing some, but we, are, we had a dependency that ended up misbehaving in the dev environment. So our tests could fail randomly. Um, meaning that we, our, our constant, uh, continuous integration platform uh, would complain a lot, meaning that we would have, have many emails, meaning that there was no real automation that we could apply further because everyone was very annoyed. And everyone was super, super sad due to that. And um, we knew it was time to uh, take this a bit more seriously. It was a small project, but again, we had to apply the same good principles that we applied as in any other object um, project. And uh, since we had an unstable dependency, we knew that we had to isolate our environment from it. We had to somehow mock it and uh, make our tests not directly depend on that. So this is a sort of uh, yeah, physical distancing from that unstable dependency. Um, as I cannot get into much detail about that specific project, and today I'm gonna be using uh, another example. Let's say that we want to create an application that um, uh, gets movies from, uh, that are currently playing in theaters, like in normal times, 
And we want to rate those movies based uh, on a um, very random metric that we have. And that is uh, based on the director of the movie. We want to uh, send back to that API a rating. So let's say that every movie that is directed by Quentin Tarantino gets a 10 and every other movie gets a three. Uh, so uh, this is our great movie application by Get and Rate Movies. Yes, I laugh at my own jokes. And uh, let's start with a simple version of that. Uh, like here it's an example of an application that uh, uses the movie database API that is a free API that you can use for your personal projects. And um, we send one GET request to retrieve all the movies that are currently playing at theaters. And uh, so we send, and we use the um, request module, we send that GET request, we get back uh, hopefully a good response, and we put it in a nice dictionary and we return it. That is all that we have to do for now. And uh, as uh, Mark is uh, really impatient and wants it to production, we need to write tests and make sure that it works fine. And this is how a test for this application would look like. Uh, we want to, we are using the unitest.mock uh, module and we want to mock the path that sends that request to retrieve the movies that are currently playing. Uh, above, you can see that we are specifying a mock response uh, that can be a much simplified version of what the real API would return. We just return the, the fields that we are interested in, really. And we have a simplified dictionary retrieved back. Um, that is a very low effort test, um, at least. And we don't have much to think about, except maybe for the first one when we are first creating. But this is easily extensible to more tests. Uh, we can write more tests where we parameterize, and uh, we expect empty results, different responses. We have different side effects when we call that external API. We can expect failures, connectivity issues, and everything else that we can imagine. And uh, that was OK. It was valid code. It was a very valid test. Now let's see what happens when we have a more complete application. This is what we want to achieve in this example. We said that we want to get the movies that are currently playing at theaters. That returns us the movie titles and uh, the director IDs. So we need to send another request to the movie database API to get back the names of those directors. So then we can apply the rating that we were discussing before. So we send, uh, on the second line, we send another request where we fool the movie director's names. And when we have all of that, let's say we want to do some filtering on all of those movies that we have acquired, because we don't want to get past it from that API in that we send ratings for other movies. We want to send only to some of them. So we're using another, uh, let's say, in-house API, the magic API. And first, we do a request to that to do some filtering on those movies. Once we do that, we have a filtered movies dictionary. And for each movie that exists there, we want to um, apply the magic algorithm that we have created that decides the rating according to the director of each movie. And then we want to do a post request in uh, the, the movie database API, posting the um, calculated rating we have. Um, in the end, we can just return the dictionaries and save them in the database or what we want to do, log them, whatever. That means that uh, for this simple application, we have five, um, five different calls into external APIs. Three of them go to the movie database API, two of them go to the magic API that we have created. Um, this, is, this seems to be completely valid code, does everything that we want. We have our uh, separate functions and yeah, all seems good. What happens when we want to test it? We patch it up, right? And uh, then uh, philosophical questions arise. How many context managers can you fit in 88 uh, um, line characters? Um, if we need to mock those five different API calls, and um, I have very strong opinions on styling and that made my life very hard. Uh, thankfully, we can use a decorator. So that would mean that our tests are gonna look something like this. We can have, um, yeah, I couldn't even attempt using context managers. So 
uh, decorators to the rescue. Um, we have four different decorators that we need to carry with us uh, in each test that we're going to write. Uh, the first one actually needs to be parameterized because we do two GET requests in the Movie Database API, um, depending on the exact request that is called. And as you can see, this is already a lot. Uh, we need uh, to write more tests and we need to carry all of this with us every time. So that test was okay, but what happens? Uh, it was okay, but what happens when we want to uh, write more tests? What about when we have different arguments, other responses, empty responses, other failures and exceptions? In that test, we want to taste our, um, our, our application and its business logic. It's not, the, it's not the place really to carry all of these decorators and test the different APIs. Uh, of course, we want to uh, test them that they are called correctly, but do those tests, can these tests even provide us that? Um, so it's easy to mix the business logic with, uh, with these um, IO concerns. Uh, so because the mocks don't really help with that, we will need to do the right integration tests. And um, yeah, that was a lot. Uh, it was very easy to forget to uh, move those decorators with you. It was tightly coupled to implementation details. So we had to change our strategy. And uh, as every good developer, when we don't know what to do, we use a search engine and Stack Overflow. And uh, yeah, you use your favorite search engine and you type, how do you write unit tests in Python? And you click on the first result and someone on Stack Overflow always has a very strong absolute opinion that says, every time you use mock.pats, it means that you have design flow in your architecture. It seemed uh, a bit offensive in the beginning, but it made us think a lot. Um, this phrase really stood out and it, it triggered more dis design decisions in our teams. Why were our tests so difficult to write? Then we remembered another principle that uh, all of us good developers knew, that don't mock what you don't own. Um, Mock.patch ties you to specific implementation details, but we wanted to test really what our application, if our application is doing the right thing. And uh, we had to make a decision. So we're all simple for developers uh, discussing Python. And then it came to us that probably we need to go back to our roots and everything that we have been complaining about uh, C++ actually. Um, so in order to write us unit tests in C++, we tend to use dependency injection. Uh, that is a technique where an object supplies the dependencies of another object instead of a client specifying what service it will use, something else tells a client what service to use. And uh, combining that with the adapter pattern, that is a term that I have borrowed by Harry Percival's uh, PyCon talk this year, uh, a stop, um, stop using box, that is a great talk and goes into further detail on those topics. Um, yeah, the adapter pattern provides an alternative interface for a class API that you are using and makes it easier to use. So it's converting an, an incompatible interface of one class into something that is more easier for your code to use. And that is not much different from just a thin wrapper around, um, around different functionalities and those uh, external API calls. So this is how a wrapper is going to look like. Uh, this is uh, how uh, we can create a new class and we can um, hide there all the different calls that we are sending to the movie database API. And uh, how we tend to use that in our code. So we said we apply dependency injection and our main uh, grade application uh, where in its initializer, it can specify the different um, the different dependencies of it that are wrapped in classes or they cannot be wrapped in classes if you don't want to do that even. And, and we, um, the code really that we have uh, below is not much different from what we had before. Instead of using functions, we now have to call methods on these uh, objects that we have created these uh, two wrappers, one for the uh, database API and for the magic API that we own. And uh, what happens when we uh, write tests? 
So now we can use the mock object of the uh, unitless of mock module. And uh, this, it's much easier to mock as the API that we have created is much simpler. simpler. It makes, uh, we have more control over it and everything is decoupled. We can add more and more uh, tests and testing in the future will be much easier. Um, the, as you can see from this test, everything is much more readable than before. We don't have ugly context managers or decorators. And uh, if you want to take it as a step further, you can even create your own uh, objects, but on top of the, the mock objects and you can reuse them in tests. Um, the disadvantage is that you have to put a little bit more effort in your tests, but the result, if you can see already, that is already much more rewarding. So as we can see, we have uh, already much more readable, extensible, flexible tests. There's no danger to forget to paths and dependency. And we don't have to care about any specific API implementation details. We hide all the ugliness into our wrappers and we have nice interfaces to work with now. Uh, we test uh, only our business logic, not uh, the IO. And um, what really stood out is that it made, us, uh, it made our design more uh, thought through. So it uh, triggered conversations in the team about how we want to design our production code, our application. And uh, this is nice uh, testing, um, testing the, uh, the implementation details of our uh, main function, but we want to test that everything plays well together, everything is connected. So what about integration tests? What happens there? Um, in, uh, in Bloomberg, we have a concept that we, uh, we call imposters which is, uh, I don't know, also called as verified fakes, which is also a fake API generator that has some verific verification for IO. So we, um, we create fake APIs, but have um, uh, strong contracts about how they can call. So we can test against them and see that the calls to them go as they should. Uh, this is how, uh, it looks like, so you can see on the left-hand side that we, how we have utilities and we can create multiple APIs from just a simple uh, feature that we have created. Um, that wor works well for uh, the internal services that we have. And if you, want, if you need to mock something, then you probably need to decide if it is worth doing more work. But in our case, it has proven to be a very valuable tool. So we have one feature that can just create all of these uh, imposters and uh, as we said, the, the advantage of them is that they have strong contracts about how they need to be called. So they need to be called with um, certain parameters and the, we can specify responses from them that also adhere to the same contract. We cannot say that we're going to return just um, a half dictionary. It has to be a full dictionary, but uh, we can specify the fake values in that. So when we make the call, uh, we hit a fake instance of that, not the actual one, not the actual service or API. We can test against uh, similarly, again, all possible and impossible scenarios because uh, users are going to find a way to use the services in the most wrong way. And as you can see in the right hand side, this is how it is going to look like. We can uh, instantiate um, this uh, magic service imposter. And again, we can specify verified responses this time that we're going to say when we make a call that calls that API, then this is the kind of, this is the response that this is going to return us. And this is a good way to verify that um, your uh, wrappers work well that you don't call them with random parameters, but you call them as they need to be called. So we have the unit tests that have uh, tested all the details of our, uh, of our implementation. We have a way to test that our wrappers work. And uh, what about end-to-end -end tests? Uh, they should just work, right? Uh, someone who regretted saying that, uh, but it is true. We have covered everything else. And now we can just test the happy paths. 
And uh, how we do that? So in the latest attempt in the team, uh, we decided to try an approach of plug and play. Uh, since we have dependency injection, we can create a generic test and we can pass different APIs uh, to that, that the test is going to use and uh, test against those. So we can, we can pass basically whatever we want. As we saw before, we could pass an imposter, we can pass any other fake that we have created. And um, this is how it can look like. So in this case, we have, uh, we create a class that is a fake API and another class that is a real API. And in our test class, we can make instances of these um, two classes that we have created. Then we can have a test that is parameterized and we can pass different APIs, real and fakes, whatever we want. And we can have only, we can write only one test that uh, tests is against both. Uh, that means we don't need to duplicate our tests and makes our life easier. And we, we make sure that those integration tests that we have before are really valid because they can also play uh, when we pass uh, the actual dependency. Uh, of course, then you can choose which test you want in your uh, continuous integration platform. Uh, you can decide how much you trust, you trust your dependencies. For some of them, it can work just uh, running all of them. For others, you, yeah, you have to make a call. Um, so this talk, what has it been about? Um, there are many values when it comes to good software design. We want it to be functional, we want it to be performant, we want it to be robust, we want it to be testable, we want it to be abstract, we want it to be extensible, and we can be discussing for hours about all of these things. Um, the important thing is that um, testable is one of those values. So I have been in a lot of um, strong discussions <laughs> with developers about encapsulation, invasion of control, is it worth to have my tests uh, change the way I write production code. Um, the test initially we saw that it was looking, uh, the code that we wrote in the beginning was looking fine, but it was our desire to write tests that make a, made us really rethink our architecture. So the pain of writing tests drove our design decisions. And as I said, many can complain that I don't want to ruin my beautiful production code just to test them. Well, your production code doesn't mean much if it's not tested and it's not working. Testing is not optional nowadays, it shouldn't be. It is a requirement of completing a task. So your tests are part of your code. You read them, you write them, you change them as you change your code, you maintain them. So testability is a good enough reason to affect your design decisions. And this is my thought on the matter. Um, that was it. Uh, thank you for listening. You can find me on Twitter here. And of course, we are hiring. So we have a channel on Discord. If you want to chat to any of our engineers, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holden. So yeah, again, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention that if you want to ask any questions, there's the Q&A button on Zoom. Um, there's, no, there's no questions, Olga. Okay, everything was clear. Uh, yeah, I, I think <laughs> everyone's software is very testable. <laughs> That's what I'm assuming. Okay, uh, yeah, feel free to chat later to um, uh, the corresponding channel. I'll be happy to discuss with everyone. I'm going to stop the share now. Cool. Can, I, I can ask you a question. Do you, have yeah. you used any um, in dependency injection library to help you with that? Uh, no, we haven't. I am aware that uh, there are some, but we haven't tried anything yet. We just, yeah, freestyled it. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, I think we can just... Yeah. Uh, I'll be happy to chat later, yeah. Okay, cool. So if you have any more questions, do drop a message on the Slack channel. Thanks, Olga, again. Thank you. Uh, for the talk. And I'll see you later. <laughs>